Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Humanities Forum, the first forum of this spring semester. We have a great uh, schedule of events planned for this semester. I encourage all of you to keep an eye out for our announcements. It would be great to see many of you back uh, again whenever you're able. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the Philosophy Department and the Humanities Program here at Providence College and the director of the forum. The Humanities Forum exists to provide a regular space most Friday afternoons uh, during the semester when the college community can come together to consider some of the deepest human things. We host a wide range of events uh, and our schedule is integrated into the timeline of the Development of Western Civilization program. Uh, today's guest, for example, is coming at a time when many freshmen are thinking about Thomas Aquinas uh, and the Middle Ages. Today's event is particularly special because it is the Humanities Forum's inaugural St. Thomas Aquinas Lecture. Though we won't be able to repeat this every year, we're blessed to, to be together today uh, for this lecture on his liturgical feast day, January 28th, the day that marks the transportation of his relics to their permanent home in Toulouse in southern France. St. Thomas Aquinas is a fitting saint for an annual lecture here at Providence College. Dominican friar who lived in the 1200s, a generation after St. Dominic himself, and at the time of the formation of the first universities, St. Thomas's life and writings have had a profound effect on the Catholic Church, on the Dominican order, and on education and reflection the world over. This lecture, and we anticipate many more for years to come, is the result of our collaboration with friends of the humanities program who have a deep love for the thought of St. Thomas, especially as it has developed within the Dominican tradition. Given the wonderful Dominican presence on our campus and in the room today, uh, we're hopeful that St. Thomas's thought might become increasingly important to our academic life here at the college. And to that end, we're pleased to honor St. Thomas and his legacy with a lecture by a prominent guest on or near his feast day. And I'm happy to say that it would be difficult to imagine a better guest for today's inaugural lecture than Candace Vogler. Educated at Mills College and then the University of Pittsburgh, Professor Vogler is the David B. and Clara E. Stern Professor of Philosophy at the University of Chicago, where she has been on the faculty since 1992, and where she occasionally brings some lake effect snow uh, to her hosts. She works in ethics and social philosophy and has published widely and presented lectures even more widely on a rich variety of topics. Since the early 2000s, she has developed a deep and abiding interest in St. Thomas, and she is now widely known as a remarkably thoughtful reader of his work within our contemporary context. She came to Aquinas through the writing of the 20th century Catholic philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe. And I myself will always remember clearly the powerful impact of her 2002 book, Reasonably Vicious, uh, that it made on me as a young graduate student. She taught me what it might mean for philosophers committed to the Catholic intellectual tradition to engage fruitfully with contemporary philosophy. Like so much of her work, that book did a remarkable job combining thinking about contemporary problems with a rich and fruitful engagement with St. Thomas and with Elizabeth Anscombe herself, a profound reader of Aquinas. I'm delighted to say that she is currently working on a monograph titled, tentatively, simply, Anscombe. Uh, it will, I have no doubt, be required reading for anyone interested in Elizabeth Anscombe, Thomas Aquinas, and the Catholic intellectual tradition. Her title today is Of Original Sin. Please join me in welcoming Professor Candace Vogler. Switch so you can hear me. Finding the pocket where it goes.
Thank you so much for having me here. It is such an honor to get to give your inaugural Aquinas lecture. It means the world to me. I hope it's OK. <laughs> My husband claims that um, he's rarely seen me <laughs> in the kind of fervor that I've been in for the past several months working on this lecture. OK. G.K. Chesterton famously remarked, modern masters of science are much impressed with the need of beginning all inquiry with a fact. The ancient masters of a religion were quite equally impressed with that necessity. They began with the fact of sin, a fact as practical as potatoes. Whether or not man could be washed in miraculous waters, there was no doubt at any rate that he wanted washing. But certain religious leaders in London, not mere materialists, have begun in our day not, uh, not to deny the highly disputable water, but to deny the indisputable dirt. Certain new theologians dispute original sin, which is the only part of Christian theology which can really be proved. <laughs> Chesterton. I mean, it, it can't really be proved. Several people have mentioned to me <laughs> in the course of working on this lecture. But how can you not do that quote? OK. The indisputable dirt is both actual sin and the understanding that actual sinners operate from darkened intellect, disturbed passions, and disordered will. Chesterton suggests that actual sin is evidence of original sin. But one could notice sin, suspect that every adult human being has sinned at some point, and even think that humans are the only animals capable of sinning without supposing that humans are born to it. Original sin is actually an uncomfortable topic. Gregory of Nyssa, a candidate ancient master of religion, who offered powerful allegorical interpretations of the biblical creation narrative, was clear that some human beings may never be guilty of voluntary acts of sin and must nevertheless be counted among those who need to seek forgiveness. Infant mortality has never been unknown among us. <laughs> um, and Gregory was close enough to serious Jew Jewish thought to suppose that there might have been righteous men who followed the law all their lives. Christians have inherited a tradition of thought about original sin from those who took it that Genesis was historical. Side note on historical. Um, I, we are all, if you're Christian, you're committed to some aspects of biblical narrative being historical in a perfectly straightforward sense. But what historical meant to both the Greek fathers and the Latin fathers, as near as I can tell, is not what we tend to mean by it today. For example, you could develop very powerful allegorical readings of material which you took to be historical. If you think about the lives of the saints, these are, in an important sense, historical, even though n nobody thinks that they're historical in the modern sense of that term, and so on. What matters is a kind of a truth that affects temporal life <laughs> and, that can, and that emerged for us at a point in our temporal existence. That's, that's enough for historical, OK? Just as an aside. Um, OK. But supposing Genesis was historical in the modern sense of that term, is something that seems majestically improbable. So why not treat the biblical material as a kind of just so story? Like how the elephant got its trunk, how the human got its, its, its what? It's um, somehow inborn propensity parceled out person by person voluntarily to turn away from immutable good. 
as though it was in any way fitting for me to sin, as though sin was not contrary to something of my nature, however widespread sin is among members of my kind, as though nothing in me knows better when I sin, even though I have never encountered an entirely well-ordered human being and expect I never will. Now, it's certainly easier to ignore questions about original sin than it is to try to address any of them in detail. But unfortunately, whatever sort of article of faith is at issue here, it seems to be caught up in a great many aspects of Christian thought and practice. Most obviously, it's hard to make sense of infant baptism without supposing original sin. What use is a sacramental practice aimed at some sort of cleansing of sin to a person who's not yet capable of voluntary sinful acts? Um, but much Christian teaching takes the point much further, claiming, for example, that original sin, quote, is the reverse side of the good news that Jesus is the savior of all men, that all need salvation, and that salvation is offered to all through Christ, close quote. That's from the version of the catechism that's being promulgated under uh, Pope, Pope Francis right, these days. On this understanding, our biblical just story is about how the human got its need for Christ. That's pretty central. Ian McFarlane puts the point this way, quote, original sin is a derivative doctrine. It is deduced from the more fundamental Christian claims that Christ is the savior of all, and thus that all need to be saved, close quote. Now seen in this light, it's unsurprising that Christian disputation about original sin has been fierce. Looking at that early narrative, um, modern scholars mark two different strands of creation narrative in Genesis, one of which suggests creation by divine fiat, by word, the other of which uses idioms associated with facture and making, and in that sense, by deed. As some of you in this room may know much better than I, there's huge controversies over what's going on in the Genesis narratives, and there's huge controversy over how it got shifted and interpreted when it was translated into Greek by Hellenistic Jews and, Christian, and early Christians. Okay. The strand which stresses creation by God's word seems to consist in eight commands followed by a blessing. The story of making divides God's, divides God's creative activity into six days, followed by a day of rest. Whether the two strands can be brought together or how they might belong to a single creation story was a matter of serious scholarly debate in the first quarter of the 20th century, a debate which, I gather, found no clear resolution on linguistic, philological, literary, critical, or historical grounds. <laughs> Nevertheless, as I understand it, there is and always has been consensus that the order and character of the creative source of things is of a piece with the order and character of how things are now. And I strongly suspect that that's always the case with an origin story. You're trying to show how what was is mirrored in what is. Okay. Literatures on original sin share the view that in the beginning, the human was as a human ought to be. Our minds were subject to God. Our appetites were subject to reason. Our bodies did not make trouble for our minds in our minds. That is, we weren't subject to illness, infirmity, or injury. The human was created perfectly ordered. Now, I have long been of the view that although it is most common to describe this happy condition in terms of downward subjection, reason is subjected to God, the lower powers are subjected to reason, the body is subjected to the mind, the tendency upward 
is the more interesting. Reason longs for God. Appetite and sense long to be reasonable. The body seeks health and harmony. And whatever you want to make of the fall, there is, as far as I know, no account of the fall that suggests that these inclinations have not survived intact. That's still with us. Okay. That we somehow know better when we act against these tendencies, even though we may never meet an adult human being who is as a human should be, is evidence of the depth of our natural attachment to how things should be with us. However far from us it may be, however inchoate or inarticulate the inclination may be, at core, we want to be right with God, right with our fellow creatures, and right with ourselves. To deny that we were given a nature directed to its own perfection would be to impugn God's justice. But the rational will, the will as governed by discursive reason, the seat of the kind of intellectual activity that an animal can have, took a fatal turn away from God. If you are fond of the Old Testament, you will notice that it wasn't a single fatal turn away. It kept turning away in ever more spectacular ways. <laughs> There's like Adam and Eve, there's Noah, there's the Tower of Babel, there's, you know, it just it keeps going and going and going. Right. Okay. Now thought about original sin took shape very slowly. It was never fully embraced in the Orthodox Church. Protestant and Catholic thinkers are inclined to see all sin as resistance to God. An original sin is a kind of explanation of the human tendency to resist God, a tendency that the human can't overcome without divine assistance. Vexing questions about original sin have been under discussion at least since the fourth century. As I understand it, modern scholarship has settled on the view that pre-Augustinian sources held that Adam's legacy to our kind is mortality and moral frailty, not sin or guilt. OK. Um, on mortality, there's two things that become very important in the literature on original sin about mortality. Right. One of them is just straightforwardly philosophical and can trace in different ways to both Plato and Aristotle, which is that the intellect is somehow immortal. It doesn't belong to, I mean, it belongs to the intellect to be oriented to the divine. It belongs to the intellect not to die. It belongs to the intellect to be in some sense incorruptible. Okay. So that's the philosophical ground. There's also an enormous amount of scriptural warrant for the thought that um, death is a punishment for sin. And that runs all the way through, I take it. So the thought is that if the human was created perfect, then the human was created immortal. That's just kind of how that line of thinking goes some of it from revelation and dogma, some of it just from plain old philosophy, OK? I mean, that's one of the bits that people nowadays find really hard to understand. Like, why, why were they thinking mortality was a problem? <laughs> sort of like, how, how can you not think mortality is a problem, <laughs> right? It's like we're in conditions of pandemic at the moment, and you're thinking, mortality, what's the big deal? It's like, sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> OK. Um, now, um, some of the really important scriptural material comes through us from, to us from St. Paul, who in Romans set up a kind of a parallel between Adam, the first man, and the new Adam, Jesus Christ. So that all fall in Adam, the first man, all sin in Adam, 
and all have the possibility to be redeemed in Jesus Christ through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This line of thinking isn't just Paul and the Romans. It comes in a lot of places biblically. Okay. Now, although it's been, it, has, it is and has been standard to claim that contemporary teaching on original sin comes to us from Augustine, it's not obvious that Augustine gave us a singular, detailed doctrinal treatment of original sin. Nor is it clear that later medieval thinkers, thinkers took it that Augustine had settled all questions on this topic. It's pretty clear that they did not think this. <laughs> to deny that the human was good at its origin suggests that there was some injustice in human nature from the very first, that God failed to equip the human properly. But how can we square God's justice with the suggestion that he somehow messed up creating humans? Right? We're supposed to be somehow the pinnacle of it, among animals anyway. Augustine argued that a child's early death and great hardship from birth will impugn God's justice unless the human was already a sinner in utero. Babies are born guilty. They inherit Adam's sin. They cannot redeem themselves by human means and hence are born needing the salvific grace offered in Christ. Infant baptism helps to offer a partial remedy, but because it neither takes away the stain of disordered concupiscence, nor renders children immortal, we can plainly see that infant baptism alone cannot address original sin. By making original sin the fault of our first parents' voluntary turn away from God, a product of human free will, Augustine refutes the kind of Manichaean tendency to suppose that evil is a force all on its own, that's sort of set up and operating all on its own in opposition to the good. Like, it, no, no, it entered through us. <laughs> the stuff that we're really worried about entered through us. Okay. By insisting that humans cannot redeem themselves from this man-made disaster, he refutes the Pelagian thought that we're fully capable of saving ourselves from the wretched condition in which we find ourselves. Now, Augustine's work left many questions about original sin unanswered. He didn't give an entirely satisfactory account of how it was that sin and guilt could be transmitted from parent to child. I mean, I think you get a good sense for the complexity of the scholastic disputation on this point by noticing that Aquinas begins his treatment of original sin in De Malo by exploring the question whether any sin is contracted by way of origin before asking what original sin is. If you've been reading Aquinas, you'll notice this is an unusual way to go about it. The unest precedes the quid est, <laughs> suggesting that how there could be a sin that was transmitted from a primal source, a first father, to indefinitely many descendants remained a serious point of concern and unease. Aquinas fields 19 objections to the claim that there could be original sin in this sense, and dutifully responds to each, of course. Now, Aquinas' work on original sin draws from Anselm's account. Anselm stressed that since only the will of an intellectual creature can be sinful, unless and until an individual human being has a rational will, it cannot have sin. That sin can no more be transmitted through bodily procreation than can the rational will. I hope that's familiar to some of you as a kind of teaching. Um, this also traces back to both Plato and Aristotle. Um, and it's there, if you've ever been present for the birth of a baby, <laughs> where you, 
looking at this unbelievably beautiful being who is in some sense the most man-made thing there is, <laughs> right? It just comes from its parents. And you realize we couldn't do anything that good. <laughs> it's way beyond us to make anything this wonderful. Um, I've only assisted in one birth, but it, it, it had a profound effect. <laughs> I walked around being amazed by everybody I saw, thinking, you were that miracle. You were that very miracle. OK. God is the source of each human being's rational will. In what sense, then, can an infant be a sinner unless God infuses a prenatal human being with a damaged soul? God would not be the source of a newly infused soul marred with darkened intellect, disturbed passions, and disordered will. This would be unjust, Anselm argues. Instead, and he urges, original sin is nothing but the privation of original justice, a definition that Aquinas accepts. Now, I don't know how directly Augustine, Anselm, or Aquinas drew from Gregory of Nyssa, who's sort of 335 to 395, thereabouts, pretty early. But Gregory of Nyssa, drawing from Platonic, Neoplatonic, Aristotelian, and early Christian sources, as well as scripture, argued that the human, as an intellectual creature, made in God's image, is free, properly immortal, properly impassive, and properly engaged in contemplation of God. All these were ours, Gregory thought, in the prelapsarian state. That we are mortal all by itself is enough to show that we've been banished from paradise for Gregory. For Gregory of Nyssa, the promise of salvation in a resurrected life is the promise of a restoration to our proper condition. Drawing on biblical uses of agricultural imagery, particularly Jesus' parables, he wrote, quote, as the body of the ear is formed from the seed, thanks to God's power, with his art, he makes the ear out of the grain itself, and the ear is neither completely identical with the seed nor completely different. So the mystery of resurrection, too, has been indicated in advance through the wondrous modifications taking place in the seeds, in that God's power not only will return you the body which will be dissolved, but will also add other splendid and beautiful characteristics, thanks to which your nature will be constituted in a greater magnificence. He says, quote, it is sown in corruption, it rises in incorruptibility. It is sown in weakness, it rises in power. It is sown in dishonor, it rises in glory. It is sown as a psychic body, it rises as a spiritual body. Human nature, after abandoning in death all its characteristics, which it had acquired through the tendency to subjection to passions, I mean, ignominy, corruption, and weakness, differentiation according to age, does not lose itself, but it changes into incorruptibility as into an ear, and into glory, honor, power, perfection in all respects." Close quote. The thought that we have been living exiled from our true home and that we seek restoration, a true fruition, through Christ gives us an especially vivid account of our lot as deprived. This is before anybody says privation of original justice, and he would have used that term. Pre-Augustinian Christians struggled to understand the universal need for salvific grace as of a peace 
with revelation that the human brought its misery upon itself. Augustine coined the term original sin and urged that a tendency to turn away from God and toward the things of the world was inherited and a sure indication that all humans need to seek salvation through Christ. Later thinkers joined in the task of explaining how there could be a sin at our origin that was not just a personal sin, but a sin that afflicted human nature. How, why, and in what way Jesus Christ, necessarily mortal, was not operating at the loss common to fallen humanity. Why the incarnation was necessary for our redemption, and so on. Still, images of the sin attaching to human nature as an absence of what the human needs for its own perfection, a privation, showed up very early in the uneven starts and stops of Christian thought about our topic. The perfectly ordered intellectual animal was once, and by salvific grace may again be, immortal, well-ordered, and oriented to God. It's possible to gather the seeds of a picture of human perfection philosophically. Theology and revelation are needed to try to sort through whether and how we might get from where we are to where we long to be. Aquinas takes up Anselm's definition of original sin as privation of original justice. Accordingly, the account hangs on a view about the character of original justice. In, in this sort of wonderful big new book, um, Daniel Hook argues convincingly that Aquinas' account of original justice underwent significant change from his very early engagement in the scriptum on Peter Lombard's sentences to the positions sketched in each of the two famous summas and explored in Damalo. Aquinas carries forward much of the traditional understanding of original justice throughout. The human was created in justice, enjoying all the perfections that the human ought to have. This was, in effect, our ideal natural state, and Aquinas agrees with much of the thrust of his predecessor's understanding of original justice as humanity's prelapsarian condition. The shift in Aquinas's view centers on the relation between nature and grace in original justice. Aquinas entered a world where the question about the roles of nature and grace in original justice took shape in a disputation over whether any prelapsarian offspring in paradise could have inherited original justice. I mean, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, but had had children, would the children have inherited original justice? Now, if original justice was simply human nature as it ought to be, and if God's justice turned on giving hum the human the order it needed to live well, then why couldn't first parents who obeyed God transmit human nature as it should be to their offspring? Many thought that there had to be a sort of a parallel between original justice and original sin. Just as we inherit original sin from our first parents, so too could our first parents have transmitted original justice had they stayed obedient to God. On such views, original justice is a sort of natural justice. Had they not sinned, original justice could have passed from Adam and Eve to prelapsarian offspring in paradise. That's this one line of view. And Aquinas is friendly to it in his earliest writings on this topic. Now, Anselm thought this was not possible. But Aquinas starts out supposing that a sinless Adam might have transmitted original justice to his descendants. For this to be possible, original justice would have had to belong to nature in such a way that grace was not a constitutive feature of original justice. No one ever thought <laughs> that grace could be inherited 
or sexually transmitted. Not how grace works. Original justice involved a kind of natural justice, Aquinas argued. Still, prelapsarian human nature required preternatural support to be as it should be. Human nature could not sustain its prelapsarian perfection without divine assistance. But for all that, fully supernatural support, sanctifying grace, although present in conditions of original justice, was not itself a part of original justice in Aquinas' earliest writings about our topic. Peter Letter sums up Aquinas' early position this way, quote, in his earliest account of original justice, Aquinas, is, Aquinas distinguishes a formal element, the rectitude of the will, and a material element, the order of rectitude in the lower powers. Similarly, in original sin, there is a formal element, namely privation of the formal element of original justice, that is, of rectitude of the will, and a material element, the privation of the material element of original justice, that is, of the order of the lower powers. This shows well enough that St. Thomas does not consider sanctifying grace as included in original justice. He finds in original justice a formal element that is distinct from gratuitous justice. The same appears in the way in which he explains how baptism remits original sin. Baptism does not, by infusing grace, take away the material element of original sin, but it removes its formal element, namely the insubordination of the will. How and why? By remedying what makes the privation of justice a sin of nature which infects the person. Quote, baptism gives grace, and in virtue of that grace, the infection which the person contracted from nature is removed. Hence, the guilt and the obligation to undergo punishment also vanish. Close quote. In later work, Aquinas came to accept arguments that original justice, like the rational will that found its happiest home there, could not be transmitted from parent to child through natural procreative activity. Sanctifying grace and original justice had to come bound together. The kind of position that would seem a clear development of Anselm's insight. If original justice is bound up with sanctifying grace, it's no surprise that one rejects the idea that original justice could be sexually transmitted. Sanctifying grace is infused, not inherited. If a properly functioning human nature requires sanctifying grace, it's no wonder that we can't remedy our lot under our own steam. In this respect, Gregory of Nyssa's image of the fully realized human is one I find especially inspiring. I mean, we could be glorious. We could just spontaneously love God above all else with ease. We could be always turned to immutable good. We could be right with ourselves, with each other, and with the whole of creation. And clearly, there's no way for us to get from where we are to our best and fullest actualization without divine assistance. Now, some recent literature on a... I hope this doesn't sound like a grab bag. There really is a kind of a line I'm trying to follow here. I just read a bunch for you. <laughs> some recent literature on original sin returns directly to the Christological core of the doctrine. It's all about why we need Christ. So th if that's the core... And Christology is where to look for an appropriate account of original sin. 
Kevin McMahon describes some advantages of this return this way. And I mean, I think that's been with you since the Greek fathers. It's not new, right? even though the article is called The New Christological Turn. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> there is, however, still another. OK, he, this is how he's saying what's great about this. There is, however, still another benefit that has come with the new emphasis on Christ. <laughs> Sorry. <That's right. laughs> like, new to whom? <laughs> like, <laughs> Sorry. Wow. Um, but I guess these young Turks believe that they're <laughs> boldly going forward. And you know, and I got to say, they're right. This idea that something Christological is at the core of understanding original sin, they're right. I believe this, as did everybody I've quoted so far. Sorry, <laughs> going back to the fourth century. Um, let's see, here we go. Uh, still, another benefit that has come with the new emphasis on Christ beyond that of reminding us how much more grace of God has abounded, quote, in the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, close quote, than sin has condemned. That's from Romans. It is the benefit of shifting attention away from the issue of the first man's sin or the first couple's or whether there was a first couple rather than a first human community or whether human communities have arisen separately in different places at different times, or whether any sin has or could implicate the entire race, has or could be transmitted, or whether there could possibly have been such a place as paradise, and in what sense human sin might have affected creation. All these questions have proven to be somewhat embarrassing in the face of contemporary science. If the central claim is that all grace is gratia Christi and that in one way or another everyone is in need of it, then the issue of whether and how this universal need is tied to the sin of Adam becomes of secondary importance." Close quote. Okay. Suppose then that we never were in paradise. The seeds of traditional accounts of fully actualized human nature are, after all, philosophical. It means operating without heavy reliance on sacra doctrina. Right? That we can have, OK, the possibility of salvation through Christ is revealed knowledge. That we can have some confidence that humans will commit actual personal sins as they grow up is common sense. That not all sins are the same is a matter of Catholic dogma. An inborn tendency to resist God is, as Aquinas teaches, sin in a secondary sense of the term. It's not the same. Um, and of course, Catholics are really lucky because we recognize all kinds, all different kinds of sin, venial sin, mortal sin, this very singular sin in a secondary sense, and so on. A very dear priest friend of mine stamped his foot at me once and said, Protestants just think sin is sin, no matter what, right? A white lie, genocide, all the same. OK. I confess that I have neither the knowledge nor the training needed to give you a fully satisfactory and thoroughly Christological account of original sin. I don't know enough to do that, even though I think that's what we need. But I want instead to press on the Anselm Aquinas definition of original sin as a privation of original justice, 
drawing from Gregory of Nyssa's images of fully actualized human nature to understand how we find ourselves at a loss. We cannot attain such a state without sanctifying grace and, as Amthelm suggested and Aquinas came to think, no one could ever have been in such a state without sanctifying grace to make it possible in the first place and ongoing sanctifying grace to keep it stable over time. I mean, both Anselm and, Aquinas, and later mature Aquinas, grown-up Aquinas, think nobody could have been in this without sanctifying grace, ever. Not for five minutes, certainly not for a life. A perfectly ordered human enjoying the beatific vision in a resurrected life will be glorious. I'm captivated by the image of resurrected human life that we find in Gregory of Nyssa. The beauty of the Cappadocian picture lies in the fact that it is so obviously drawn from an understanding of human nature, so obviously desirable, and so obviously out of reach without Christ. Suppose that this is a representation of human participation in God's glory. Now, Aquinas treats this topic especially clearly and economically and considering what we seek when we ask that God's kingdom come. We seek our own ultimate perfection. It's the very last written piece in the Compendium Theologiae. It's, it's part two, chapter nine. It's really amazing. If you want an incredible, elegant summary of Aquinas' views on many topics. The compendium discussion of the Lord's Prayer is a great place to go. What we seek is our own ultimate perfection. If this is a reasonable starting point, I take it that we can assume that we are born morally frail and mortal, beings oriented to an ultimate good that we cannot attain for ourselves. This becomes the sense in which we are born to conditions of privation. We are born needing salvific, sanctifying grace if we're to attain the end that is ours by nature, even though the means to attaining that end are not ours from nature. To claim this is just to claim that in giving us immortal intellectual souls, God did not simultaneously hand us everything needed for perfect and incorruptible life. We're born mortal, weak, and by nature oriented to eternity. Kind of amazing and wonderful or terrifying, if you think about it, depending on your mood, I guess. That's our lot. In this line of speculation, that becomes what it is to be deprived of original justice. Does the fact that I was born needing extra assistance from God and needing to seek that aid through Christ suggest that God has been unjust? Did God wrong me when I was still in my mother's womb? Should God have given me more than my longing, my intellect, his revelation and access to dogma. Anselm thought not. Anselm argued that since the human is not owed original justice, withholding original justice from any individual human being is not itself unjust. In this sense, we're not so much born stained with a kind of disfiguring birthmark on the soul as we're born without the kinds of gifts needed to share in God's glory. Instead, we enter the world bound to satisfy this debt by seeking salvific grace in Christ. If I understand him, this is the core 
of Anselm's account of original sin. And it's animating a great deal of what Aquinas works out later in his time with this topic. Now, my hunch is that one could develop such an account in a way that was respectful of modern science and respectful of church teaching. I've tried to do little more than sketch the barest outlines of such an account, lacking both the training and the balance required to walk the tightrope between the two. But this is what I made for you. I hope it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have about 20 minutes for discussion. And if you would, if you have a question, if you could wait for me to bring you the microphone so we'll record your question, that would be great. Uh, and it's our custom to offer the first question to a student if there is a student question. I think that means they all agree with you, Candace. <laughs> Unless they all just stopped being able to focus on anything after I was far enough into it. Do keep thinking, and maybe you'll think of some. I'd be, welc I'd be happy to take questions from faculty as well. I loved your talk. I, I teach at a Protestant school. I teach Darwin. I teach Dante, who makes distinctions about sin. So I know what you're talking about. It's nice to be in Providence for a year. Anyway, let me get to my question. Um, your, your, your argument still leaves the Manichaean problem, doesn't it? I mean, there are spiritual folks like, I'm thinking of the poet Czesław Milos, who uh, said, you know, what, what, what is this aboriginal catastrophe? I think that's Newman's phrase that has left us in such an awful state. Not only humans against humans, nature red in tooth and claw, all the pain um, that we all see uh, and experience. Um, I love your conception of it. I, 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 we, we were born flawed. I, I, I don't know if anybody, you've all read Confessions, right? Um, nobody likes him picking on infants, Augustine. You know, I mean, very few anyway. I mean, I, 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 I'm with you about the miracle. But yet we have this, what we would call a fallen state. So does uh, your argument still leave open that sort of bugbear at the door of the Manichaean? Well, there's an original kind of evil somewhere? Maybe not. Just help clarify that if you would. Thank you. That's a terrific question. Um, the line that I'm sketching actually does away with original sin in the traditional sense that there's an origin of the race that's the source of it. It does it, it gives it person by person, in a sense. Um, so individual by individual, we're deprived. We don't come, we come in with actually quite a lot, right? <laughs> it's not like, the situation of the infant is dramatically impoverished. Right? It's like you've got really quite a lot, and then the thing that is yours is to figure out how to face the struggle of a life oriented to eternity with bits that don't automatically go together in the way that they're sort of meant to go together. That thing about the upward tendency, I actually believe that. Um, and not just because like some of my favorite medieval poets were kind of like, I wish I was a cat. The cat always wants what's good for it. Whereas what I seem to want is my neighbor's underage daughter. Like, what's going on? You know, sorry. I didn't mean to be ribald or something, but. <laughs> Um, but this envy of non-human animals, just because instinct provided for them, and we have to figure it out. And that's harder. 
and we are morally frail, and we are mortal, and we are oriented to eternity. I think all those things are true. Um, so, I mean, I don't know that you need... Um, one worries where to be with church teaching. Uh, which I take very seriously. I hope that was clear. Um, I take it very, very seriously. And uh, it was up until very recently, it was like you had to profess monogenesis, you know, um, which I, is not the case currently. But um, does that help at all? Yes, but he got he got he was declared a heretic. So I don't, but I don't. Maybe the Dominicans could explain that better. <laughs> yeah, I mean you can you can you can go astray a lot of different ways. <laughs> Gregory of Nyssa wasn't quite tarred with Oregon's brush all the way, but it's like he didn't entirely escape some of it. Um, yes, thank you very much for for challenging us. Thank you, Paul, for your question, advancing the conversation. Um, now, John Hick wrote a book, and there he developed a typology. Um, Augustine's understanding of original sin and the Irenaean type. He doesn't claim that these are historical. They're types. Um, and the so-called Irenaean type is that both Adam and Eve are born immature, and so are we. I'm just wondering if your position like dovetails with this or approximates it in some way. I mean, I think where there's a big point of contact is going to be that um, we're born needing to figure something out. And that it's a long road of development and work to try to figure it out, making use of what there is for us to make use of in doing that. Um, immaturity in the sense that the human, if all goes well for everyone in this room, going to all wind up in getting to participate in the life of God in a beatific vision. I mean, I apologize to the non-Christians in the room. It's like you could just treat that as Vogler's weird thought about what would be really great. <laughs> okay. You know, I, I, and, and if you don't like Vogler's weird thought, read Gregory of Nyssa. It's unbelievably beautiful, like his idea of what it would mean for us to be fully actualized is gorgeous. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I just had a, the question, you know, to relate these issues to the motive for the incarnation. As you know, Aquinas says that, you know, had there been no original sin, God would not have become incarnate, or at least that's the most probable conclusion, yes. right? That God would not. That would seem to make original justice not Christic grace. It would involve certainly sanctifying grace, certainly divine grace, but not Christic grace. But all graces subsequent to the fall have as their root power, right, the uh, actual and, and anticipated, the incarnation and, and the actual and anticipated merits of Christ, right? Yes. The, um, so I just wonder, wh where do you, how, how do you fit that into your theory of original justice an original sin, in other words, that um, I mean, I'm, if the grace is not originally Christic, uh, yeah, we'll just, uh, if you could develop that, that'd be great. It's part of why I think um, I'm, I'm not talking about original sin in the traditional sense, because I'm not talking about a temporal starting point 
of human nature where primal parents sinned and then that was inherited. And I mean, Aquinas early on was struggling like anybody would to work out how that could happen, right? And I mean, I think the letter gives the clearest summary of what the early view is like. Um, he winds up, but I agree that it, it, the original justice in the tradition can't be Christic. It can't be, because they haven't fallen yet, right? <laughs> they haven't sinned. And if they haven't sinned, then there's no need for the incarnation. There's no need for salvation through Christ. God would not have had to become man. Um, I mean, a ton of Anselm's writing about it is just about trying to understand as an act of love God taking on a human nature, given how messed up a human nature is. I mean, it's like, my favorite gospel is John. I mean, not just because it's sort of philosopher's gospel or something like that, but um, the idea that the whole of creation, that Christ is involved in the whole of creation, means that that kind of grace is, an an, is animating the whole of creation. Always created. Yes. Right, right, using Christ. And I mean, that's really important. I mean, I think Henson, which is even important in Mark, but it's harder to trace it. But it's certainly clear in John. Um, and so Aquinas on the Trinity is really complicated. Anybody on the Trinity, except maybe my confessor, is really complicated. <laughs> my confessor is just like, well, you know, just think about having an idea of yourself. <laughs> That's what it's like. <laughs> it's like, really? Um, but um, so I'm with the Franciscans in supposing that you've got to locate Christ at the beginning. Um, but I don't think that's contrary to Aquinas. Because if you read his commentary on John, it's really clear that he feels the force of Christ through the whole of creation. Candace, thank you. I, if I'm understanding you correctly, we need to do away with the language of original sin and maybe even the fall, because those things seem to imply moral culpability. And if I'm understanding you correctly, that's not the right way to think about our original position. Does that seem right? You need some element of culpability. At the, you need something to go wrong at the beginning of each human life because everyone needs salvation. And that's the... Um, flat-footed way of handling Augustine on babies being born guilty. Okay, I mean, if you've ever attended one of the traditional baptism rites, it's just really intense because you have to get rid of some of the evil in the baby before it can even enter the sanctuary. It's like, so there's that whole moment. Um, but um, so there's got to be, to make a sense of sacramental practice, I think, there's got to be a sense in which we're culpable. Um, but the way that Anselm tries to treat that, given various things he thinks, is by saying that the child is born with the need to satisfy a debt, the need to, I mean, of course, he's thinking the debt is inherited. but. What he means is that 
you're born needing to use the means available to you to seek Christ. Right. Um, and you can't actually take that journey for a very long time, which is how come the starting point has to be understood as sin in a secondary sense. But he sees it as just you're born at a loss. Um, I find this particularly moving for all kinds of reasons, um, partly because of dumb human anecdotal stuff. Um, suppose my parents had been given a fantastic inheritance. Unbelievable wealth was theirs. And they squandered it on I don't know what foolish thing. And now I come into the world, <laughs> and I'm born in poverty because my parents did this thing. Um, there's a sense in which neither of my parents had a piece that they needed to sort of be prudent with their resources. So there's a way in which a twofold absence produces a situation in which I've got to figure out how to make a living without a whole big boost from behind. I mean, that's a kind of low-key way to think about it. Um, with Augustine, it's more like I inherit a birth defect or an illness or something. I mean, he's really drawn to that kind of image. Um, but I think it's more like you're born at a loss, and it winds up being the task of your life to figure out what to do about that. And you're equipped with the longing that if you were to really follow it out, is going to point you in the right direction. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. So you're at least born at a loss. <laughs> yes. Sorry. He's got to come and give you a microphone. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I, I, I'm over here. <laughs> sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, uh, maybe, Mike, maybe you just answered my question to a certain extent. Um, I, I find what you're saying actually very interesting, very compelling, and I end up teaching uh, you know, quite a bit on, on original sin, and there are cer certain aspects of it that I always find a little dis difficult to explain not just to the students, but also to myself. Um, and one of the things which you mentioned at the very end of your talk is this concept of, um, of sin as a stain, and that that is um, that's such an important image that we find in the prayers, in the liturgy of the early church. Um, and what does one what does one really do with that uh, washing away the washing away the stain? And I mean, I'm I'm thinking especially, um, you know, lex orandi, lex credendi. I mean, we can't just we can't just say, well, we don't we don't hold that anymore and and eliminate oh. that. At the same time, I mean, I'm I'm really I'm you've given me an awful lot to think about here, and I didn't realize that so much about Anselm. But if you have anything else to say on that, I'd I'd be interested in hearing that. I mean. I'm inclined to, um, I'm profoundly moved by all the talk about turn, cleansing the stain and getting rid of the stain and washing away the stain. Um, as a Protestant convert, I love reconciliation. It's like one of my favorite sacraments because it come away feeling clean. And there's no other word for what it feels like to have made a proper act of contrition and so on and come away clean. Um, now, I mostly associate that with actual sin and personal sin. Um, The way I'm trying to think about the sin in nature, which is what's really hard for me, 
Um, I no problem thinking about per actual sin. Just read the newspaper. Just watch TV. You'll find it. Um, just look deep in your soul. Um, but I'm trying to think of the stain in a certain way more psychologically than anthropologically. Than anthropologically. So I'm thinking of it as what it is to have a being that everything about it wants to move toward a state that it cannot get on itself. And the, in that sense, the stain is like um, a bad leg or, uh, you know, it's, it's like you don't want to do away with the urge and the longing. That's like the best thing you've got going for you. But the honest appraisal of your own imperfection just will leave you feeling a little dirty, <laughs> uh, quite apart from actual sins, which you probably, I, I've committed. I, I have. Um, so at least in the, the imagination I'm trying to have for this that doesn't make light of church teaching. I'm more inclined to read the stain discussion psychologically, partly because the feeling of being cleansed is so powerful. And it, it, it feels as much psychological as anything else. Um, I don't know if that helps. You may just think, Oh, wow, that's affirming. <laughs> that's deeply affirming. So, um, if I may. <laughs> I can't see okay. where. Oh, there you are. Hi. <laughs> I have a pedestrian question and then a, a second question, which seems to read more on theology, really, than philosophy. But first, the pedestrian question. Could you just enlighten me when humane generis was modified or withdrawn. And here, for example, is a sentence that talks about um, the sources of revealed truth and the acts of, magister of the magisterium of the church teach that original sin proceeds from a sin truly committed by one Adam and which is transmitted to all by generation and exists in each one as his own. Yep. And so just for my own information, when was that withdrawn or altered or what have you? Very recently. By and or how? The, go ahead. Um, open the possibility for um, populations rather than just uh, a single couple. And that was promulgated under, right, the commission was called and their report was promulgated under John, John, I think Paul, John, II. John Paul II. So that's the, the highest level of authority that I know on that question. But I'm not sure that it addresses the generation of, or the, the promulgation of the sin from generation to generation uh, by adoption, as it were, rather than starting anew with each individual. I mean, But, but that's one question. The, the other question really is it's somewhat very, re related, it, and that is that I, I see your point to think about original sin more as a privation than an affirmative stain. And that's you know, right down the center of the tradition of the church. And I particularly appreciate your point that we have in our nature the longing for God. 
So that's that upward pull as opposed to the subjugation. But we lack within ourselves, and always did, hence the need for grace, even before the fall, but we particularly lack within ourselves the right ordering of our elements of our nature in order to pursue that path well, hence the need for redemptive grace. Ultimately, yes, but if you, if you okay, I'm a, kind of a big Aquinas fan. If you think about Aquinas on things like acquired and infused virtue, right. What acquired and infused virtue in different ways with different ends and different sources are both aimed at doing is at least promoting cooperation among our powers and coordination among our powers. So they're meant to be helps. They can't, they can't take the place of grace. I mean, infused virtue is, of course, gratuitous, but um, they can't take the place of what we gain through Christ. Um, but I always think that reading Aquinas on virtue shows you a way that you can work toward not impeding the work of grace in your life. <laughs> right. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm a teacher. It's like, the big hope is that you don't do anything in a classroom that impedes the work of grace in the life of one of your students, right? When you have no idea what that is, right, or how it's there, you just know that it's there, right? So you don't want to block it. And I take it that the, all the material on habit and so on that he's pulling from Aristotle and other sources is about a thing that is in our power to work on and that um, helps us stay out of our own way, at least. Does that help? Yeah, and maybe you could reiterate in a sentence or two the late uh, Aquinas as compared to the early Aquinas on, oh. on this issue. Um, early Aquinas wanted it to be that um, Okay, the easiest way to see it is through this supposed parallel between original sin and original justice. All of them think original sin, it's transmitted. It's transmitted through procreation from parent to child. The big question becomes, could original justice have been transmitted from parent to child? In the very early stuff, inheriting a very long tradition of thinking about this, Aquinas is thinking, original justice, that's just human nature operating the way it's supposed to, right? If that's all it is, then it's natural justice, and that is the kind of thing that parents can give to their children. So you could inherit, so maybe Cain and Abel could have inherited original justice. Sadly, they inherited original sin and, and got very bad, OK? Um, so early Aquinas is drawing from a very long tradition of thought that those two have to run in parallel in the prelapsarian state and then the postlapsarian state. It has to be this parallel. I think partly through working with Anselm and taking on board a lot of what Anselm had to say about it. He quotes Anselm a lot in this stuff. Um, and then also just appreciating the, that what he's calling original justice and natural justice had to somehow be sustainable. I mean, it, it's not just, I had martyr courage. Happily, it landed right as I was walking toward the fire. Right? <laughs> right? And then I didn't have martyr courage, and it was there when I needed it. But then I, I didn't. Um, it can't be that original justice is like that. It's got to be that if it's natural justice, it's somehow sustained. And he's thinking there's no way. The human nature can sustain that. How does human nature on its own sustain 
proper obedience to God, <laughs> right? Going all the way through the being doesn't. So, no, there has to be gratuitous justice as an, as an actual part of original justice. Does that make sense? That's, I mean, so the thing about transmission is how the nature grace thing really crystallizes in those debates, as far as I know. I think we've got time for one more question this afternoon. And let me remind you, when we, after we conclude, we'll have a reception in the great room where I hope we'll all uh, repair to continue the conversation. Thanks so much for a very stimulating talk and a stimulating conversation afterwards. I'm, I'm thinking with the problem here, I, I, I'm a theologian, so my occupational deformation is to try and think, well, what are the... <laughs> What are the kind of doctrinal parameters to work with here, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of fault, but only analogously. It's yep. transmitted by, a pro, by some kind of propagation and not simply by imitating Adam, right? Right. And it incurs in some way an alienation from God. That's right. Um, so and then I'm thinking about your description of us being born at a loss, which I think is highly suggestive, and then the piece about original, the question of original justice, which is highly suggestive, in a way that I want to think about with you or ask you to think about, ask your thought on, and that is, goes something like this. So we have, there's a problem of development, right? And so Thomas says, even in the garden, we would need preternatural gifts to deal with that. Um, there's a problem of the disproportion of our natural capacities to our supernatural destiny. Yep. And then there's another problem, or another set of problems, which is actual personal sin and original sin, which in the, when he's talking about it in the soteriology, he usually talks about it as the sin of the race, which I think is also really suggestive. Uh, yep. So I just was thinking about kind of the categories that you were giving us and it seems to me, and I wonder what you think of this, part of the thing that happens to us is that we're born into a situation where f from the beginning there is a brokenness, not just in us individually, but in the world that we're born into. I'm not sure that this satisfies all the doctrinal criteria, but I'm just thinking out loud. A world that is antecedently broken and in which adherence to a merely natural mean of justice is actually insufficient from the beginning for us. That, w that, that we, what we need to, is to do is to live according to the kind of justice that's possible among sinners, which is the justice of the cross, and it's a supernatural kind of justice. Yep. And so there's a kind of a defect already of the way we are because of the situation that we're broken, we're born into, and a culpability. The, uh, analogous culpability, at least in the sense that we have some responsibility for it, even though we didn't ourselves create it, but we've inherited by a kind of propagation, a situation <coughs> that we're responsible for, but that taking responsibility requires of us a different kind of justice than natural justice in that, in the sense of just the natural, rational mean of justice could ever suffice for. I'm just wondering about thinking about the problem of original sin in relation to sort of that constellation of, of pieces, which, I, which I, seems to kind of come out of the things that you're, the pieces that you're putting on the table for us. Um, thank you. If, that, if you can sense that in what I put on this table, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of the kind of thing I'm trying to move toward. I'm not a proper theologian, right? I'm, I'm a philosopher. I'm not... I'm, I'm not even a proper historian. I mean, I read lots of old stuff to get ready for this talk, and I've been thinking about lots of old stuff for a long time. But, um, but uh, yeah, it does require more than the mean of natural justice, which is, of course, a real mean, right? It's just you require a supernatural mean to actually get to the situation, to address the situation we find ourselves in. And the stuff about being born in a, born in a broken world, I really, I think that's really important. I mean, that's, um, 
in, in Chesterton's quip, that's like practical as potatoes, right? Everywhere. It's all around. Um, and and, it, and you, you can feel it in individual lives. Um, if you ever encounter someone who was born to very inadequate parents, like terrible, terrible parents, right? You c- it can appear that each parent was missing a set of things that were needed to give the child what the child needed to thrive. And it might be completely different things on the part of the two of them. But you can sort of have a sense that their insufficiency (laughs) emerges as a kind of inherited privation. It's sort of like um, a joke I used to tell about feeling like a lot of the people I knew grew up with their parents' bad childhoods, <laughs> right? And like we're still trying to deal with the after effects of their parents' bad childhoods, that there was some sense of things getting passed along in slightly different forms, but that that was there. Um, and that, um, those are a set of just kind of commonsensical anecdotal things that give you some sense of how you could inherit a privation and find yourself needing to do something that you wouldn't have had to do if that hadn't been in your background. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. I hope you can come down to the reception in the great room. And please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you.